John Scalzi is a New York Times bestselling and Hugo Award-winning author and former president of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. Perhaps best known for his Old Man's War series and for his blog, Whatever, Scalzi has also served as a creative consultant for the Stargate Universe television series. Andy Weir built a two-decade career as a software engineer until the success of his first published novel, The Martian, allowed him to live out his dream of writing full-time. He is a... What are they, what are they doing? <clears throat> I'm going to get through this. Uh, he's, a, he's a lifelong space nerd and a devoted hobbyist of such subjects as relativistic physics, orbital mechanics, and the history of manned spaceflight. His new book, Project Hail Mary, is a thriller full of suspense, humor, and fascinating science, and is now in development as a major motion picture with Ryan starring Ryan Gosling. Please welcome John Scalzi and Andy Weir. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> How are you, Andy? Doing well. How about you, John? You know, I'm doing all right. I have, I have just flown in, uh, come back from New York City Comic Con. Uh, I'm here. I have an event tomorrow in Lexington. I'm all over the place. And then I'm going to sleep for about a month. That and, sounds good. And, and how are you? I understand Aren't you are... you uh, on a tight deadline for your next book? I, you know what? Let's not speak of deadlines <laughs> right now. Let's not speak of... And how are you? I understand you have a... a uh, uh, a certain someone keeping you up at night. Yes, it is my baby. Uh, my wife and I had a baby. She did most of the work on that one. <laughs> and he's 16 months old now. He's my little buddy, and he's the reason I haven't been writing lately. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I wish I had that excuse, right? Yeah, you know right. what I mean? Your and baby is uh, 23 years old. My baby is 23 years old. Yes, she actually, so. she actually writes on on the on the blog, the whatever that we were talking about. Uh, and so now I can be like, I got nothing. It's your turn. Go on. And she's like, my time to shine. And she, <laughs> she's been doing a lot of like cooking stuff. I've gained like because she's really good at writing and she's really good at baking and she's doing a lot of baking and writing about the baking. I have gained like six pounds in the last month and I am absolutely loving it. So. <laughs> I have gained a lot of weight as well, but I don't have any excuse. <laughs> well, since we are here to talk about Project Helmet, one of the things I did, I used to be a journalist. I don't want to talk about that. No, no, no. No, I'm sorry. We I just to... want to talk about my coin collection. You know what? I have a 1939 don't, You know, don't, don't dare me because we will go on forever about the coin collection. Numismatics, <laughs> that, is, that is something that's that... That's hot. That's hot. That's hot yeah. stuff. Books, Man. who cares? Books are lame. Coins, they're great. I think we can all agree that have reading a... is for losers. Do you have... That... So here's the question. Here's the real question. Do you, like me, have a Scrooge McDuck like coin, coin vault. Obviously. Obviously. Because people go into writing for the money. Right, absolutely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? And, um, and, and, and the poon tang. Uh, yeah, I mean, you that's, know, it's just come that's on. That's really what it's about. All right, first off, bonk. Oh, I thought we were doing a wet t shirt thing. No, right? no, no. I got the wrong no, bonk. <laughs> All right, no bonking. All right. No bonk. Uh, so, I actually, because I was a former journalist, I actually wrote up 10 different questions to ask him just in case we weren't able to make conversation, which is clearly not the problem <laughs> here. But before I do that, I want to talk about the very first time I ever met you. Okay. Um, and I believe we were arguing over which date particularly was, but it was like 2014. And I think it was about, it was the lock-in book tour. I, yeah, it was yeah, right around there, yeah. and it was at the, the, the bookstore in Mountain View. Mountain View Bookstore, and it was lovely. Mountain View, California. Yeah, and it was a lovely bookstore, and um, and I remember because you know I did my I did my little shtick, and then came you, you came through on the signing line, mm -hmm. and we introduced, and I was like, and I of course had had known uh, about the Martian, and I was like, you know, because you had started uh, it. Uh, as self-published, and then it got picked up, and I was, and I w wanted to be encouraging to a brand new author, and I was like, "Well, how's that doing for you? How's everything going with that?" And it's like, "Oh, it's fine. I've, Ridley Scott just wrapped up the movie." <laughs> <laughs> 
And I'm like, so you're doing well. <laughs> but I do actually want to talk about that, because you did actually have a very unusual path I to did. traditional publication that started through, uh, you know, kind of self-publishing. So talk about that a little bit for the folks who don't actually know this story. Well, um, I kind of bungled into it. Yeah. Basically, um, all my life I wanted to be a writer, and I've been writing ever since I was a little kid. I think the first thing I ever wrote was a um, Beverly Cleary fan fiction. So, <laughs> Henry and Ribsy short story. I was six years old. It was about a paragraph long. It right. lacked plot elements. But anyway, so I've always wanted to be a writer. Um, all, through my teen, all through my tweens and teens, I was writing short stories and sure. stuff like that. As, college, as, as, as I eventually it became time to go to college, I had to pick a major and I wanted to decide, honestly, I was really into computers, but I was also really into writing and I wanted to decide between, you know, going mm -hmm. to do a literature major or, you know, computer science. Sure. I decided I wanted regular meals, so I went for computer <laughs> science. Fair. And um, uh, so I was a computer programmer for many years and always writing in the background. And then uh, I worked for AOL at the same time you did. Yes, as it indeed. Happens. We both worked for AOL on opposite sides of the country. We right. never met during that time. Right. But um, <clears throat> I worked for AOL, and then I got laid off in 1999 when they merged with uh, Netscape, because that just should give you a, a feeling for how old I am. <laughs> and uh, then I ended up with enough money in my severance package to go literally about three years without having to work. So I thought, okay, here we go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a book. Mm -hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going to take a sabbatical, write a book. So I did that, wrote a book. It wasn't The Martian, you've never heard of it, the book sucked, and nobody wanted to publish it. Right. So I did pay my dues for what it's worth. Sure. I, I, I went through the standard tale of woe that all authors ultimately have to endure, which is can't get an agent, no, no interest in the story, nothing. So after three years, I decided, by running out of money, that it was time to go back <laughs> into the workforce. And so, it, but this wasn't a sad Charlie Brown music, hang your head situation. Right. This right. was like, I liked being a computer programmer. I always enjoyed it. So I went back into the industry and just wrote on the side. Yeah. And I posted things to my website because of this newfangled internet thing. I thought it'd be a cool place to do that. Right. And over the course of 10 years or so, I accumulated about 3,000 regular readers. Right. And it sounds like a lot, but 10 years is also a lot. Sure. Um, that, <laughs> that averages to like one new reader per day. Yeah. I mean, that's nice. Yeah, that's, that's good. Cool. Yeah, that's, that's good. Nice. Um, and I was writing, I started writing like, short stories and stuff like that, and I also started writing serials. Yeah. And I had three serials going on at a time. I'd just post a chapter, yep. and, and then email everyone on my mailing list. That's where I get the 3,000 number from. That was the size of the mailing, the mailing list. mailing list, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and so one of them, one, one of my serials that I was working on was about a mermaid in the 1800s uh, right. off the coast of Maine. Another one was about aliens invading Earth, and the third one was The Martian. And so... Bit by bit, over the course of three years, I finally posted and finished The Martian. Then I was done. Then people started emailing me saying, hey, I love, I love The Martian, but I hate your website. Yep. Which is fair, because it was terrible. Yeah. It was just bare bones, just... Hand-rolled HTML. Yeah, it, literally. Yeah. Hand, Handwritten HTML, like white background, black text, blue hyperlinks, the Soviet tractor factory of websites. Right. Okay. And... Um, Vintage 94. Yeah, ba you know it, baby. And then, um, <clears throat> so they said, like, can you make an e-reader version so I can read it in a good format? Yeah. I said, sure. So I figured out how to do that, posted e-reader versions to my site, said, knock yourself out. Then I got more emails saying, like, hey, love your stuff, hate your site. I see you have e-readers, uh, e-reader versions available, but I'm not very technically savvy, and I don't know how to download a thing from the internet and put it sure. onto my e-reader. Sure. Can you post it on, to, like, Amazon so I can just use their system? Yeah. Figured out how to do that. Pretty simple. You just um, you, you post it. They have Kindle Direct Publishing. You post it there. You must set the price to at least ninety nine cents because mm -hmm. they actually sell Kindles at a loss. It costs Amazon more to make a Kindle than it costs you to buy one. It's the Gillette theory of yeah, right. It, it's a loss leader. That's yeah. all it is. And so they know. And so they sell it at a loss, knowing that you'll buy books, and that's how you'll make money. They, they will make money. So that means that self-publishers are not allowed to give away books for free because the last thing they would want is for, the, for you to buy a Kindle and they take a loss on that and then you do nothing but read free books. <laughs> right. So you have to charge. That's communism. That's <laughs> communism. Well, I mean, 
regardless of how you feel on that, it is a bad business model. Yeah, it's not a very good business <laughs> model. You, when, you don't become a billionaire by giving away the books for free. Right, yeah. So um, anyway, I set the price to 99 cents, which was the minimum. They take 65 cents out of each one of those. Sure. So pulling in a cool 34 cents a copy. <laughs> And uh, I just posted it and said, like, oh, they hang on to it for like 24 hours to make sure it's not goat porn or something. Right, they right, right, have right. a human look at it. Well, first of all, don't judge. <laughs> Second of all, they just want to make sure if it is goat porn, it gets categorized correctly. Right, exactly. There's a whole, there's a whole goat porn category. <clears throat> right. I mean, I, I, not that I know. I've exhausted it, really. Anyway, but, um, <clears throat> anyway um, then, then, then it becomes available for sale. And I said, here you go, you can read it for free on my website, download the e-reader for free from my website, or pay Amazon a buck to put it on your Kindle for you. And people were buying it, it really took off. Sure. It was like lightning in a bottle, still not really sure what I did right. And um, it made it up into the you know, top Kindle, then top of all sure. things and stuff like that. Then I got approached by a literary agent. Yeah. Um, he said like, hey, do you have an agent? I'm like, no. And he's like, you want one? I'm like. I looked him up to make sure he's a real person. Yeah. And then Random House approached me and said, like, hey, we think this could make money as a print book. You want to do that? And I'm like, talk to my agent. And then, and then Fox uh, yeah. said, like, hey, we want the film rights. And I'm like, talk to my agent. My agent said, talk to his film agent, which I didn't even you know didn't I had know one. You had one. Yeah. And so now, then I had a film agent. So now I've got, like, people. Yeah. Right? And so all this is going on while I'm still a software engineer. So I'm in my cubicle fixing bugs, then running off to a meeting room to take a call about my film deal, then back to fixing bugs. It was a very surreal time. The, uh, the print deal and the movie deal both came together four days apart. Yep. So that was in one, one work week. I took that Friday off to just lay down. <laughs> Fair. Fair, yeah. Fair. Yeah, and so that's how I ended up backing into writing. You guys know the rest. Um, the, the book did really well, then they actually did make the film, which both of us can tell you is rare, mm -hmm. and then um, they, the film did really well, and the film was basically a hundred million dollar advertisement for the book, so yeah. the book sells R it. Rumor was it was like nominated for best picture. It was nominated for seven Oscars and won zero of them. Right. So, <laughs> so how does it feel to be a failure? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. I've been one all my whole life. Um, uh, yeah, and so um, that's how I ended up bungling into writing. Yeah. And as you know, once you're in, you're in. Yeah. And well, then you can just kind of crap out whatever you want, and they'll publish it. I mean, just look at your books. I mean, yeah, and, no, mine. So, <laughs> you know, I have been, I have been, I have been just coasting for years and years <laughs> off of Old Man's War, and sooner or later they will catch me, and by that time I will already be too late. It'll be too late. Because I've already bought a church, so they can't okay, do well, anything with it. Okay, hang on a minute. I got a bit of a disagreement here. Raise your hand if your favorite Scalzi book is Old Man's War. Yeah, so, okay. Raise your man hand if your favorite Scalzi book is Red Shirts. Yeah, you haven't been coasting, man. Nerds. You're doing good. Nerds, you're all nerds. You're doing good. <laughs> you're doing good. Well, I mean, but there is something to be said. I mean, one of the things that I always tell people, because, you know, my Old Man's War, my experience is actually very similar to you. Put it up on the website, had no intention of really monetizing it. You know, uh, an editor was like, hey, can I publish it? I'm like, sure. They said, would you like a two book deal? Sure. <clears throat> you know, uh, and then kind of go. And when I tell people that, um, writers, two things. First, the writers want to stab you to death. But the other thing is, um, they're like, you know, you got lucky. And I'm like, oh, hell yeah. Yeah, I mean, there is, there are it's many... It's an enormous amount of luck. It's an enormous amount of luck, and it is one of those things that I always think is really important to acknowledge, right? Yeah. It's like, for whatever reason these things happen, they happened and, and we got lucky. We'll take the luck. We'll and, take it. Yeah, and then you capitalize on the luck and you make sure that you actually do the work so it is actually luck as opposed to that one weird thing that happened that one time. Yeah, and then people ask my incompetent ass, how do you become a good writer? I'm like, I don't know. I don't it's know. It's like, ask a lottery winner how he won. Yeah. I don't know. It's like the, <laughs> it just worked out that way. But it is one of those things is that I do think it's it's worth it to, to say. One, you are actually a good writer because there has to be a le certain there's level. There's a minimum. There's yeah, a, there's, there's a <laughs> level of competence that you absolutely have to do uh, to do that. But the other thing is that also one can also acknowledge it's like yes, good writer, also luck. Now moving along, you're into book three now, Project Hail Mary, and why that book and why now? 
Um, not right now, like right now, because it's in paperback now. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. why did you choose that book in particular to be the third book? Um, that I mean, for any, whenever I'm writing a, deciding what my next book will be, it's just whatever idea is exciting me the most, mm -hmm. right? I'm sure, I suspect you're the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just, uh, so uh, PHM was sort of a pastiche of a bunch of unrelated ideas that I had that I glued together in a way that people didn't notice. So basically, I had long had an idea of just a story of a guy waking up aboard a spaceship not knowing why he's there, sure. and then doing a bunch of scientific experiments to figure out that he's aboard a spaceship, yeah. because he has what appears to be gravity. And, and so that, that was just an idea I had, but I'm like, but there's nowhere to go with that. I'm like, I, I don't know. Yeah. And then unrelated to that, I had the idea of, wouldn't it be cool if we had a mass conversion-based fuel? Yeah. You know, a fuel that actually takes mass, turns it into light, that is like literally the most effective fuel that is physically possible. Sure. That'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. And then another thing is I always wanted to write a first contact book. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then also between The Martian and Artemis, by the way, Artemis is known as Andy Weir's other book. <laughs> <laughs> it's about the moon. You might like it. Take a look. Um, <clears throat> but between The Martian and Artemis, I was working on a different book called Jek. Mm -hmm. And um, that was about aliens invading Earth. It was soft sci-fi, had faster than light travel, telepathy, all this stuff like that. Yeah. But um, it sucked. So I got 70,000 words into it and realized it sucked. Yep. For those of you who don't know, like, The Martian is about 100,000 words. Right. So, like, that's how far into the book I got before I realized it sucked. Sometimes it works that way. Like, I was telling yeah. you, I, like, I'm, I'm writing a new book now, right? And I got... Uh, I got COVID, so for a month I couldn't write. And then for the month after that, I was like, well, I'm better now. I can write. And I wrote 40,000 words. And then the COVID fog lifted, and I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> you only thought you were better. I, I was like, who, who wrote this and who thought this was a good idea? Why? Because It's better now. <laughs> It'll be out in August. It's fine. But, uh, but yeah, no, it was like you, sometimes you don't know until you are far, far enough in. But anyway, yeah. so you were 70,000 words in. And I, and I ditched it. I called my publisher and said, like, hey, you know how I have this uh, contract to do this book and it's due soon and stuff like that. I'm like 70,000 words in. Can I ditch that, write a completely different book, and you give me an additional year on my deadline? And they said, sure, no problem. Because they'd been reading this what is, I'd by been the writing. Way, this is... This is They've been reading what I've been writing. Yeah. Now, this is also where uh, uh, other authors come to stab us. Right? Well, yeah. I, I don't know about that. The reason they let me do it is because they knew that it sucked. Right, right. I've been writing so far. So, uh, and, then I, and then I wrote Artemis, which was much better than th that crap. However, that crap, Jacques, had a few little nuggets of awesome right. like, dotted around in it. So I stole them, uh, stole several of those elements for Project Hail Mary. And one of them was the character who became Strat in Project Hail Mary. Yeah. She was one of the main characters in Jack, and so I, I just lifted her out and put her in. Well, I think that's actually really important. You know, the thing about um, whatever you're writing, no matter how malformed that it eventually is, um, there's usually a couple of things that you can, nothing is, is a complete failure. There are things that you can take from something that doesn't work place them into something in a different environment, and all of a sudden they become useful. Yeah. Yeah. And so gluing all these elements together made Project Hail Mary work. Right. And I guess the main, the, the, the main shower epiphany was astrophage. Because at first, I, I don't know, I, I, I'm not sure what percentage of you have read it, Project Hail Mary. Raise your hands. Oh, okay, this is good. Hey, we're not going to worry about spoilers too well, much. Well, this is good because the rest of you are going to get spoilers galore. Um, <laughs> sorry. But you really can't talk about this book without spoiling. We talked about it before the event. We decided, eh, it's, it's going to be spoilers. It's, it's been a year. Yeah, uh, it's been, yeah, you've had, you've had time. No, no, no pity. You know what, Darth Vader? Luke's dad. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By the way, in the Bible, Jesus dies. What? So, yeah, um, he, anyway. Um, so many spoilers, I don't know. What to do <laughs> um, so, anyway, uh, yeah, um, so Astrophage it was kind of the big like light bulb for me. It, it, basically, I was thinking, okay, I want there to be a story about what we could do with a mass conversion-based fuel. Right, right. Because like, we could do any, if we had like, something like Astrophage, we could very easily colonize the solar system. We could do all that stuff. Sure. That's all we need. So I'm like, okay, but 
I, want, I also want this to take place modern day. I don't want to have something in the distant future. Um, so I want this modern day, and it's just not plausible to invent a mass conversion fuel with modern day science. It right. just, it, it's just not plausible. So I'm like, so how do they get it? Yeah. I'm like, okay, option number one, the trope all sci-fi authors start with is alien artifact. But I was like, okay, first off, that would give them a limited amount of it. I want a whole civilization based on this stuff. Right. And then, um, um, but then I, in Jack, one of the nuggets was the fuel that the aliens used was this stuff called black matter. Right. And it was just a technology. <sighs> this is a, I, all of a sudden, I just flashed back to red matter in the 2009 in, in today, Yeah. Yeah, I came up with black matter before they start calling their thing red matter, but yeah. So this is, black matter is just, well, it's black because it absorbs all wavelengths sure. of light and then turns it into uh, mass energy in the form of more black matter. And I never bothered to explain that, but I was like, that's cool because if you have a little bit of black matter, you can make, a lot make of more. Matter. Right. And I said like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do something like that. Maybe that's an alien artifact that came and then they have black matter and they grow it and stuff like that. And I'm like, but... Then I got to explain where the aliens are, what, what that's at all right. about. Suddenly I got extraterrestrials in here, and what the hell is all that about? I don't know. And then also I said, and also black matter is just a little too magic for me. I'm a hard sci-fi writer. I like, to, I like to delve a little bit deeper in yeah. there. And I, I said, like, well, black matter, it, let's see, it absorbs energy and makes more of itself. That sounds kind of like life, mm -hmm. right? And I was like, okay, what if it's a life form? Yeah. What if it's a life form that reproduces and has this massive energy storage? Sure. I'm like, okay. Well, a few problems with that. First off, a life form that has that much energy storage would have to basically live on a star. Right. Like, there's no way you'd get that much energy from an environment like on a planet. So it'd have to basically live on a star. Right. I'm okay. This is an alien life form, so it lives on a star. Great. And then why does it need all that energy? Yep. And I said, oh, of course, it needs to spore out mm -hmm. and, and go to other stars. It's just mold. I'm like, okay, so this all makes sense. That explains why it has the energy, how it gets the energy. This is all nice and self-contained. And let's say humanity got a hold of it. And I, went, I worked for quite a while thinking, what if humanity got a hold of some of this stuff? We started breeding it up and used that to build an interstellar thing. And I'm oh, sorry, interplanetary, you yeah. know, colonize everything. Then I could work on the cool political stuff between Venus and Mars and stuff like that. And I was thinking about this whole thing about just the, the use of astrophage. And I was like, oh, they'd have to be really careful not to let any of that get into the, our sun, because right, right. that'd be a disaster. One Mississippi, two Mississippi. Oh, that's the book. Hey, there okay, we go. Okay, that's the book. That is the book. There Forget all go. that other stuff. There, that's yeah, the book. Okay, that's now the we got it. Now, now we got it. Now, now we're <laughs> cooking with gas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that was the shower epiphany. Yeah, that, and actually, I want you to explain the phrase shower epiphany because I know exactly what you mean, but I want you to say to all the, all the rest of the kids. Well, the idea, uh, I mean, it's not always in a shower, but the idea of a shower epiphany is like, usually you do a lot of thinking in the shower. I don't know about you, but I've won so many imaginary arguments in the shower. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, you do a lot of thinking in the shower, and of course writers think about what they're working on, yeah. and that's so they call it a shower epiphany when you, when you finally manage to solve a significant plot problem or link together two unrelated events in your book, and you're like, ah, oh, yes, I've got it, I've got it. Yeah. And that's... It's the, it's the, because one, the shower is where all my plot points get developed, right? Because I'm just literally standing there and there's nothing else to do except eventually clean myself. Um, but, the, uh, but the whole point of it is, uh, there's something to be said about doing things where your body is occupied, but your mind is not. And it doesn't have to be shower. It can be doing the dishes. It can be mowing the lawn. It can be driving. I drove three hours to get here today, and, and while I was doing that, I was plotting uh, for Starter Villain. Which you ran over four in. people, but it's worth it. You know what? When the book comes out, you'll they see it They were on it. the freeway. They knew what they were getting <laughs> into. You don't like the way I drive. Stay off the sidewalk. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Um, but no, I think it's... Uh, but I, the, the shower epiphany has done so much for me. Now, you were talking about wanting to do these various scientific concepts and build them out and make them sound reasonable. And this is something that science fiction always has to deal with. And it's not just you or me, there's that great apocryphal story uh, about Larry Niven having written Ringworld and going to MIT and a bunch of engineering students were like, you know, uh, your Ringworld is inherently unstable. And he tried to like pass it off as a joke and they started going, Ringworld is unstable. Ringworld <laughs> is unstable. And he ended up writing an entire novel, The Ringworld Engineers, just to be like, Argh. 
you know. Yes, it is. Yeah, there. You have your answer. Are you happy? Slam. Um, so let's talk about doing the, doing the thing, which is having the science, having enough science that, so that it sounds <coughs> plausible-ish, mm -hmm. uh, but also giving yourself the freedom just to create, for example, a, uh, you know, single-celled uh, creature. That, yeah, yeah, organism that eats the sun. Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, well, for me, that's my whole shtick is like yeah. hard sci-fi. I try to stay as realistic to science as possible. Yeah. I'm always, I'm always breaking some rules in my books. Yeah. Uh, it turns out for um, Project Hail Mary, the, the rules that I break, the, the physics that I violate is all the way down at the quantum level. So I feel good about that. Right, exactly. It's like literally you have to go that deep before you it's, find it's it. Right, right down there, the only person checking your math is Einstein. Right, I mean, and he's dead. He's dead. So... <laughs> Hey, um, actually, no. Einstein didn't believe in quantum physics. Right? No, he didn't. That's he right. called it so spooky. It's like, there it's was like there was Schrodinger or Heisenberg. It's, well, there was just an article in the New York Times where they were talking about um, the two great battles of quantum physics. And on one side was Einstein, and the other side was Einstein. And you know, he had two <laughs> other collaborators. One was Einstein and Rosen, and they were talking about the wormholes, mm -hmm. the Einstein Rosen bridge. And the other one was talking about spooky action at a distance. Right. And that, and now. The guys who just won the physics Nobel Prize were like, but what if we mushed them together? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and they might figure out what's going on uh, in the universe. And I remember just reading this article, which was consumer level. It's like, it's like my brain hurts in many different ways. Uh, and this is the stuff I do for a living. But this, is, but this is my point. It's like you and I both work where we have a wide audience, some of whom are physicists, and some of whom aren't. Right. And, and how do you balance about knowing what is the amount of information to put in and what is the information to fudge? Yeah, well, for me, I, I try to be as accurate to science all the way down as much as I possibly can, because right. that's my thing. Yeah. Um, the thing about like what do I tell the reader is I, need to, I, I try to just tell the reader the minimum amount of science information they need to understand the events yes. of the plot. Because if it was up to me, I'd just exposition all day long. <laughs> it's like, did you know how cool this is? And the reader's like, no, this is not cool. This is boring. Only you find this interesting. Like, As you know, Andy, yeah. it's a, the, here's what happens when you go into the quantum realm. Yes. Um, but yeah, so my, uh, my, my, my BS in Project Hail Mary is that astrophage... Um, the way it stores its energy is as neutrinos. Right. And neutrinos are notoriously difficult to interact with. Yeah. You have 100 trillion neutrinos passing through you every day. Right. Just you. The rest of us, none. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm <laughs> no. a neutrino magnet. Yeah, baby. No, but neutrinos pass through us and the entire planet Earth and then keep on going without hitting a single atom. Right. Um, but astrophage somehow is able to contain them. And they're bouncing around inside the astrophage cell membrane without ever escaping at all. Right. How? Because I said the astrophage cell membrane has a feature called super cross-sectionality, which is a, a quantum physics term that basically means how likely are things to interact, intersect. Yeah, yeah. And I said, it, the, the likeliness is one. And that surely does not happen. <laughs> no, no. But, no. Uh, but it's cool. It's deep enough then most people won't notice. And the people who do say like, well, at least he went that deep. I appreciate I, it. I understand where he was going with that. <laughs> that's wrong, but I get it. That's, the, that's the, one of the things that I always say, because I come at it the other way, which is that, uh, so I have a philosophy degree, and the last bit of math that I was able to do was the quadratic equation in eighth grade, right? So uh, there is no... <laughs> Philosophy degree. Yeah. Is there, is there a doctor in the house? Yes. yes. I'm a philosopher. He's going to die. We're all going to die. <laughs> uh... But the thing is, is so I, I, you know, I don't explain the science because I know the moment that I try to explain it, I'm just going to fall face first on the concrete and come up with shattered teeth. Yep. Give yourself some credit, though. You actually do come up with cool narrative ways to get around having to deal with the science. You say, like, the way you go faster than light is by going to a parallel universe where you are in a different location that's far away. And the only difference between your universe and this universe is an electron in Andromeda is in a slightly different yep, place. Yep, absolutely. And, and so it's like... You can't prove that wrong. You can't, you can't prove, you can't prove <laughs> you can't it wrong. And then when someone and you didn't violate the speed of light or anything. You right. And then when somebody says, oh, I would like to know more details, the person who knows like, you don't have the math for it. And yeah. thus ends all discussion. You, you wouldn't understand. Right. Which is to say, I don't have the math for it. 
and I wouldn't understand. And so this is why I, I do, I, but I do believe there's the balance of there's just enough so that the people who don't care can be like, that's good enough, we'll keep going. And the people who do care would be like, oh. And then they come to these events like this, and they're like, so this is how I think it works. And they blah, blah, and then I'm like. And you're like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> that is absolutely right. You're the only one who got it. Don't tell. Because <laughs> I don't want to. Write wanna... that up and email it to me so I can double check it. Right, exactly. Yeah. That's going to be great. I'm going to send that off to uh, some of my friends at Caltech. That'll be great. <laughs> um, speaking of plausible ish stuff, let's talk about <coughs> building aliens. Okay. Uh, Rocky, you're Rocky. an alien. Uh, Yay! Everybody loves Rocky. Everybody loves Rocky. Everybody loves well because Rocky's awesome. I wanted to make him a likable character. Yeah. Obviously, he's the deuteragonist. He's the you know the whole the whole book is a buddy comedy basically. Right. It's just you don't know that at first. Do you know the smartest thing you did in describing Rocky? What? Comparing him to a dog. Yeah, everybody loves dogs. Yeah, it's yeah. just as soon as you say he's the size of a Labrador retriever, everybody sees Rocky as a as a Labrador retriever with rocks. Yes. Uh, except for being a five-legged spider. But yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So he's but, scary for a second, but then, but then, yeah. I think part of the, yeah, it's amazing. I, I wanted Rocky to be a likable character, but I realize we're not talking about his, physic, his physical body no, yet. No, but but we, what, we will get to that in yeah, a second. Yeah. But his personality, I wanted him to be a likable character, obviously. Um, I did not realize the upswelling of love that people would have for Rocky. People are like, hey, man, I love your books. I love Project Hail Mary. I would die for Rocky. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm like, okay, that's great. I'm glad. And I think it's a combination of things. First off, he's, he's, he's a likable guy. Right. You know, he's, he's, he's noble. He's self-sacrificing. He's out there to save his species. Sure. He's, he's, the, he's a good friend, you know, yep. all these things. But also, because of his accent, he has almost a childlike demeanor. So he just seems like a being of pure good. Right. You know, he, he doesn't seem to be, like, nefarious in any way and stuff. So he ended up being way more likable than I was shooting for. But I'll take it. Right. You know, I'll take it. Um, as for building the alien, which I believe is the, the actual question you asked. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a lot of science fiction tropes that drive me crazy. As I, well, they actually don't drive me crazy. I'm watching Star Wars, watching Star Trek, watching Doctor Who. It does not bother me that all the aliens are kind of bipedal hominids with forehead bumps and everybody's comfortable in the same environment and stuff like that. That doesn't bother me. I, I can enjoy soft sci-fi. It's right. okay. Right. I'm not that, I don't have a stick that far up my butt. But um, for me, I like to write realistic science fiction and I'm like, okay, realistically, I can't take a penguin from Antarctica and put it in my house without him dying. Right. I'm also banned from the zoo. But... <laughs> <clears throat> um, so it's very unlikely that you'd be able to take an alien from another world, put him in our environment, and he would survive. Right. So I thought, like, okay, forget about any of that. Forget about trying to make them have compatible environments. Just accept that they're not going to. Right. So I started off in building Rocky's species, the Iridians. I started off by saying, like, okay, where are they from? What is the environment that their species yeah. evolved in? Yeah. Okay, and so for that, I chose the very real exoplanet, 40 Eridani AB. That, that's a real planet. It is the first planet in orbit around the 40 Eridani system. So it's that, that star system's equivalent of our Mercury. And it's much closer to the star than Mercury is. Right. It orbits the star about once every 46 days. Mm -hmm. It's very, very tight and close in. 40 Eridani is very similar to the sun in terms of its luminosity, its output, its size, all that. So, and, and the color bands and everything. So I said, like, all right, we'll start. We have this planet there. We also know its mass. It's about eight times the mass of Earth. And I said, if it was a gas giant, it would be gone because you can't be that close to a star and not be just absorbed by the, and gas. And if you're a gas giant or, like, something like that, and you're that close to the star, you'll get absorbed by the star or blasted away. Right. So it has to be a Rocky-style planet, no pun intended. So it has to be basically like the same density as Earth. Right. So I said, let's say it's the same density as Earth. It's eight times the mass of Earth. So how big is it? Now I know how big the planet is. I know what the surface gravity is, about 2.1 Gs. I'm like, OK, that's cool. Second off, because of other plot-related reasons in the book, I needed there to be liquid water. Yeah. So it has to be liquid water on the planet. I'm like, but that planet's going to be really, really, really hot Yeah. because it's right next to a star. So how do you have liquid water when you're way over 100 degrees Celsius? By having a lot of atmospheric pressure. Yep. The higher the atmospheric pressure, the higher the boiling point of water. 
So I worked out, okay, it's going to be like 210 degrees Celsius, and you can, you can do that and have liquid water if you're at like 29 atmospheres of pressure. Yeah. Okay, cool. Wait a minute, if there's that much atmosphere, then light probably wouldn't be able to make it through all the way to the ground. It's so thick. Right. And I'm like, okay, then they don't have vision. They don't, they, you wouldn't evolve eyes if there's no light, if, if there's no benefit to evolving eyes. So they don't have vision. That's cool. And what else have we got? Um, in order to maintain an atmosphere when you're that close to a star, you better have one badass magnetic field. Right. Um, Mars doesn't have an atmosphere anymore because it didn't have, have a magnetic, magnetic field. field. We do, so we get to keep our atmosphere. Mercury, whatever atmosphere it had, got blasted off long ago. I don't want to hear about Venus. I don't know what the hell's going on there. It's like 90 <laughs> atmospheres of pressure. Shut up. Anyway, but I decided that Arid, which is what I call their homeworld, has to have a one hell of a magnetic field. Yeah. So how does a planet get at one hell of a magnetic field? It has to spin fast. The rotation rate of a planet is what, and its ferromagnetic core is what determines its magnetic field. So I'm like, okay, it spins really fast. Yeah. So now I, I kind of arbitrarily chose, that it rotates once every six hours. So now I have the length of their day. Yeah. You know, bit by bit, I'm building up the environment that they evolved in and then start working outward from there. Right. You, you build the world, then you put the, right. put the characters Right, what would evolve it. in this? Right. Exactly. So that's why they're kind of squat, extremely strong, low to the ground. Right. Yeah. But they still have personality. Of course they do. Yeah. Uh, among other, I, I, did, I went way down the rabbit hole. There is so much more to Iridian biology than you ever see in the book. Right. Um, and I mean, I defined how their muscles work, how everything works, and everything like that. Among other things, they have a, a hot circulatory system and, a cold, and an ambient circulatory system. Right. So one of their circulatory systems, their blood is hotter than the boiling point of water, even in their environment, hotter than the boiling point. Right. The other system is colder then. And so they have these spongy, their muscles are like spongy material with little beads of water in it. And when the hot one, they, they, they suffuse it with hot, blood and the water boils in it so that it expands. They suffuse it with cold blood, the water condenses so it contracts. They're steam powered. Okay, so this is how old I am. When, I, when you were mentioning that in the book, mm -hmm. my brain flashed to the McDonald's commercials from the 1980s where they Keep had the hot side hot, hot and the cold, cold side, side cold. cold. Yes. That's right. Yes. By the way, for those of you who are old enough but have also forgotten, it was Jason Alexander who was the spokesman for that, a.k.a. George from Seinfeld. Right, exactly. Anyway. So, yeah, that was, that was, that's where my yeah, brain yeah, went. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, you keep the hot side hot, cold side cold. Anyway, I defined all this stuff and I said like, well, in their hot circulatory system, cells can't survive. Nothing can survive. No, no, none of the cells in this biome can survive in a boiling environment. Sure. Um, so I'm like, how does it, how does this body take care of areas that are too hot right. for cells to survive? And I decided, okay, when they sleep, they sleep, they go into a dormancy period, the hot circulatory system cools down enough that they can send their worker cells in. It's all automated to repair whatever parts right. of the body need to be repaired. But then I realized, okay, well, that would mean when they're asleep, they're literally paralyzed. Right. Because you cannot move unless you can heat up the muscles. So it takes them a while to fall asleep, to, to shut down. Then it would take them a while to heat it back up. Right. So that means they're completely helpless right. when they're asleep. They're literally paralyzed. They cannot wake up. Right. Which, and that, then I decided, okay, that's why they have a social instinct, because they have to watch each other sleep. They have to guard each other. Right. You know, if you're asleep, I'll watch you so predators don't eat you. Then when I'm asleep, you watch me. That's how you end up with right. villages and cooperation. So that's, that's why we have that t-shirt. Yeah, go stand up. Or, show yeah, him. stand up, show everybody. He's wearing a shirt that says, I sleep, you watch. <laughs> All right, I'm going to ask a couple more questions uh, of Andy, and then we are going to go ahead and do the questions. So... Lightning the round for me now? Lightning round for you. Okay. If, if you were a gerbil, what would your name be? No. Um, Mr. Scrabbles. Mr. Next. Scrabbles. Very nice. <laughs> uh, actually, no. Uh, here's a question for you. Uh, your prose is clear, and it's to the point, and it has a lot of humor in it. Um, where does that style come from, and who would you call as your influences? Um, I'm not sure. I'm sure Terry Pratchett. Uh, it affected me a lot in terms of the humor. Yeah. Uh, Dave Barry, the columnist, mm -hmm. was a big influence on sure. my writing style. Um, yeah, I, I, I say those are big influences on the specific style of prose. In terms of the storytelling style, it's all Asimov, Heinlein, and Clark. Sure, but those I think are my you, boys. I think you you bring up something that is that is actually really important because when I talk about who my influences are. I always go out of my way to go, uh, people like Nora Ephron, people like William Goldman, 
who did Princess Bride, uh, people like Ben Hecht who did a whole bunch of noir stuff, that there, is, there are influences in our writing that come from outside of science oh, yeah. as well. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, well outside. Yeah. That's Douglas right. Adams also, although I don't get as far into the absurd. No. It, it, but, but, I mean, I, I, I learned a secret that only me and a million other people know, which is that uh, the reader will accept any amount of any amount of raw, boring exposition if you make them laugh while they're reading it. Yeah. So they'll, yes. just, they'll just accept it. Yes, absolutely. Now, have you had any experience uh, being claimed as an influence by any younger writers yet? Uh, no, not no? not 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 so as anyone's told me. Oh yeah. There's a lot of fan fiction out there of my books, right. so I don't know if that counts. But no one has ever said like. Oh, yeah, I, I write in the style of Andy Weir where he is an influence on me, or at least not that I've heard of. Oh, okay. Uh, you should get ready for that. Okay. I'm just letting you know. Well, people will only really appreciate me after I die, you know. So. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, well, I'm 50 now. It won't be long. Right, yeah. No, you are really literally on death's door now. It's, I know, it's, it's, I know. Speaking as a 53-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> um, now... Uh, we were talking about this backstage uh, a little bit. We were like, so, hey, how is your stuff coming along with film and TV? And yeah. hey, da, ha, ha, ha. But talk about the experience of having your stuff developed for film and TV. Because there's the difference between writing the novel, writing the short stories, which you literally do in your own hole, and then having to deal with, like, literally everybody else that's right. involved with these things. Well, I mean, I've only had one thing actually made so far, and that was The Martian. And my only job on that was to cash the check. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I had no authority whatsoever, no say over any part of the project. I didn't, like, I was not any sort of authority. They could do whatever they want and, and not right. consult me at all. They chose to consult me, right. which was nice. They got my opinion on things. Sometimes they took my advice. Sometimes, sometimes they, they didn't. Yeah. But, you know, uh, when Drew Goddard was working on the screenplay, he was on the phone with me almost every day asking me, usually science stuff, sometimes creative stuff. Yeah. When they were shooting it, occasionally Ridley Scott would ask me some questions, always science stuff. He doesn't need my help on the creative. And, um, <laughs> and, but it's cool. He cared, uh, Ridley Scott cared a lot about making it scientifically accurate. He wanted to keep that feel from the book and the film. So like one of the questions he asked me was like, hey, we want to show Mark pouring hydrazine uh, from one container to another out on the surface of Mars. He's wearing his spacesuit, you know. Is that, can we do that? And I'm like, well, it would boil off in Mars's environment. It would immediately just vaporize and just boil away. Yeah, yeah. And he said like, all right. And that was like the last I heard of that discussion. And then when I saw the movie, I see that, you know, Mark hooks up a, a like a hose, click, click, and then turns on a pump. And I'm like, right. oh, cool. There they go. They, so they, they paid the, attention. The, a couple of main places where I affected the movie was, um, first off, in the book, the uh, main NASA guy's name is Venkat Kapoor. Yeah, yeah. He's Indian. In the movie, he's played by Chiwetel Ejiofor, and so he's, he's an African-American. And so they said, Venkat Kapoor seems like a weird name for this African-American guy. And so they said, Andy, we need a new name. Like, on the phone. Yeah. Like, we need a new name for Venkat. He's a black guy. What's his name? I'm like, Vincent. They're like, okay. And that was it. <laughs> that was it. Like, that was his name from then on. Right, right, right. He's just Vincent Kapoor for the movie. And um, also another side note for any Indians in the audience, um, I chose the name Venkat Kapoor when writing the book because I had a very good friend named Manu Kapoor. Yeah, yeah. And so I named him partially after him. And I had a professor that influenced me a lot in college named Venkat Rangan, right. who was also Indian. And so I just made a portmanteau of there. And I said, Venkat Kapoor. Okay, yeah. that's no. cool. That's neat. Problem is, there's a lot of individual subcultures in India, yeah. and they're all extremely distinct from each other, right. and they do not cross their they names don't. over. Right. So having an Indian named Venkat Kapoor is like having an American named Shaniqua Goldblum. <laughs> okay? <laughs> These are incredibly different cultures that do not overlap very much. Yeah. And so I just said, like, yeah, his parents are met in America. And yeah. <laughs> no, I have, a, I, have a, I have a character in one of my books is named for a friend, Uptal. And, mm. uh, and I thought it was a fairly common name. It's like, no, it was a typo, right? So it should be Abdul, right? And Abdul. like literally like every uh, Indian, I'm like, that's not a real name. I'm like, it's a real name. I know the guy. I, I know a guy school, that I went to school with him. Yeah. But yeah, no, yeah. These, these are the things. Um, but the one, other, the one other effect I had on the film was I said, hey, you should play Gloria Gaynor's I Will Survive over the ending credits. And so they did. I was like, nice! 
I had I had something similar that happened with uh, so Love Death and the Robots. They have a number of episodes that I did. And one of them was the yogurt took over uh, when the yogurt <laughs> took over, uh, and they showed me it in process. And I thought that they just had a scratch narration track, you know, when the yogurt took over. And someone was talking, and I'm like, this is amazing. You know who would be awesome at this? It's like. Uh, Maurice LaMarche, who was the guy who did The Brain and Pinky and the Brain, Father on Kids ah, Next Door, all that sort of uh, stuff. The Orson Welles voice. The Orson yeah. Welles voice. And I was like, he'd be awesome. And they're like, you're right. We've, we've, uh, you know, we've paid off the other guy, and now we're getting Maurice LaMarche. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God. I fired that other guy, and I didn't know. And he so got paid? Somebody, he got paid, which was so important. But it was just one of those things that somewhere out there, a voice actor wants to stab me. You know, <laughs> and I'm, I'm looking at it. The last one is, is very much of a Barbara Walters sort of question. Okay. Okay. You are going back in time, and you are meeting 15-year-old 15 year Andy Weir. Okay. Uh, what is the thing you tell him, and what would you tell younger and or newer writers now? Go. Well, to tell... Young 15-year-old Andy Weir is um, get help for your mental health issues no. earlier. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I have. I, 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 I wasn't fishing for applause, but that is my kind of. I guess we all have our like cause, and for yep. me, it's mental health. Um, I think it's like Mental Health Awareness Day yesterday or today or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is just a coincidence. Uh, I, uh, I spent a very large portion of my life just constantly fighting with depression and anxiety, mm -hmm. and I just figured it was, that's who I am. Right. But it's not. It's just like if you break your leg, that's not who you are. It's just you have a problem, yeah. and you need to get medical intervention to fix it. Right. So you need to get help. There's been tremendous strides in um, medication, stuff to help with um, you know, depression, anxiety, mental health issues. And then just as if you went to the doctor and got your leg fixed, you also need to do the therapy afterward. Right. So it's, it's a big deal, but it doesn't mean that you're fundamentally broken. It just means there's something wrong, and it can be addressed and fixed, and your life can get better than it is. Right. And I wish to God somebody had told me that when I was 15. Right. Because I lost so much of my life just being in a clinical depression, just yeah. unable to function. I mean, I was a non-functional human being for a large portion of my life. Right. So once I... Finally got help, got meds, got therapy and stuff. Everything turned around for me. It wasn't like this overnight. No. Hey, no. But it just, everything got better. So that's what I'd tell 15-year-old me. Right. To would-be authors, uh, give writing advice. Um, mm -hmm. I have my three bits of advice I always give. Number one, um, in order to be a writer, you have to write. You have to put your butt in a chair yep. and type things into your word processor. Yep. It's not enough to daydream. It's not enough to imagine. It's not enough to sit around world building. You have to write the story. And the moment you start writing the story is when you realize all the problems with your story. Yeah. When you write that first line, that's the instant you realize, oh, this is not as awesome as I thought. Oh, crap, I made 10,000 years of history that the reader needs to understand. How do I exposition that to them? Yeah. OK, so you have to actually write. Number two, resist the urge to tell your story to your friends and family. <laughs> it's very difficult, especially if they're interested, which they're probably not. But if they are, right, it's very difficult because uh, most writers, not all, but most writers are driven by a desire to know that other people are experiencing the story they came up with. Sure. Um, when you tell the story verbally, that satisfies that need within you and saps your will to actually write it. Sure. So if you make a rule for yourself, the only way anyone can experience my story is to read it. It will help motivate you to write it. Now, you can give people a chapter at a time to get that sweet, sweet validation that you crave, yeah. but just make it so that the only way anyone finds out about it is by reading it, yeah. and that'll help you dramatically in getting things done. And the third piece of advice is, there's never been a better time in human history to self-publish. Yeah. Um, there's no longer an old boy network between you and, um, and the readers. You don't need to convince a publisher that your work is good. I definitely recommend trying the traditional publishing route first, but if you can't do that, don't give up. Self-publish. It costs you nothing. What have you got to lose? Yeah. So that's my advice. Okay, so here's what we're going to do with the questions. We'll start over here. We'll alternate between them. We're going to do these, like, try to do these lightning round as quickly as I can. If you're going to ask me a question, why are you doing that? It's Andy Weir's show, so uh, direct them to him, and you try to answer them as quickly as possible. Sure, okay. I'm ready. Start, go. I really love the way you're very descriptive in, um, uh, you know, telling about the technology, and I was wondering if 
that exists just in your mind's eye or if you actually draw out schematics for things? I do draw out schematics for things and I, and I run all the numbers and run all the math for the inventions. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, go. Uh, one of the, the biggest shocks for me was that Ryland was, spoiler alert, dragged, literally, literally, almost literally drug kicking and screaming into the mission. What was the thought process behind making the, the hero of the story actually a coward? Um, I wanted him to have a story arc. I, I, I love surprising the reader, and so that was probably a surprise to most of you. Um, I, <laughs> yes. I, want, yeah. I wanted him to have a, a, a story arc where, okay, you find out, and he discovers much to his dismay that he was a coward, but then in the end, he decides to sacrifice himself or, or attempt to sacrifice himself. Yeah. Next. Uh, hi. I really love the audiobook versions of oh, your books. Oh, fantastic. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Ray Porter. I, I do notice that you have an exclusive deal with Amazon to make them only available on Audible, which prevents libraries, including this one, from yep. making them available on their websites. Yep. And I was wondering if you were maybe going to stop doing that. Uh, <laughs> it's fair. It's a fair question. And the answer is no, I'm not going to stop doing it because they give me so much money. <laughs> it's like so much money. So I'll tell you the same thing I tell everyone else. If you, if, you, if you want to experience the audiobook and you don't want to pay Amazon, just pirate the damn thing. <laughs> I don't mind. Yeah. But, then, but then donate that money to a literacy charity. Yeah. Go. My question is also about the audiobook, but I hope to be uh, whatever. Uh, you had a little bit less uh, input in the movie than you did the book, right? Right. Um, did you have input in creating the audiobook and selecting the narrator, and, and how much can we uh, thank you for the success of that uh, audiobook? Um, I was involved in selecting the narrator. I mean, they, well, it was more like I get approval kind of thing, and I said yes, and then, um, I mean, I think if I'd said no, they would have just kept working on me. So I didn't have much say over it, although I was involved in creative discussions on how to do the audiobook. We talked a lot about how to do Rocky's voice. And it came out really well in the audiobook. And so I, I was involved in those discussions. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Next question. All right. So I didn't trust Rocky for the majority of the book. And the reason is. is <laughs> we kept waiting for him to lay his eggs in Ryland or something. Right. Right? So the reason is a lot of hard science fiction writers have a very pessimistic view of how we will ever encounter first contact. And, and what is your thoughts and why did you go with the direction that he was actually going to be helpful? Um, I'm a very optimistic guy when it comes to humanity. Um, I tend to write, I mean, it should be pretty clear from my books that I tend to write fairly optimistic views of the future. They have problems that you wouldn't necessarily want to have, but, they're, but, they're, but humanity in these stories comes off pretty good. And the same thing with, like, Rocky's race, you know. Yeah. It's just, uh, I believe that it, it's very easy to get pessimistic, um, but you just don't notice how good we are at being humans uh, and how good we are to each other on overall um, because you just see nothing but relentlessly negative stories. But I would point out that the negative stories you see on the news or that you hear about are notable because they are the exception, right? The vast majority of, of human interactions is positive and cooperative. And I would say, so I put to you this simple question of, you know, would you rather live now or 100 years ago? Furthermore, if I teleported you to a random location in time, would you rather live at that location or 100 years before that? You will almost always choose the most forward point in time that you can possibly live. And that kind of shows that humanity is just always making the world a better place. It may not seem like that in the short term, but that's fine for you. Sorry. Go. Uh, for the 26 or so years that Ryland was gone, do you think that the world kind of fell into a, like an anarchy for a little bit? I get asked about that a lot, and I have to give the same cop-out answer. I don't, I don't define what isn't in the book. So basically, you're asking me to write a sequel right here on stage, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I, if I do that, if I do come up with those answers, I'll write a book, and then I'll get an exclusive audio deal with Audible. <laughs> <laughs> Big pile of money. All right, next. Um, hi, I just uh, self-published my first uh, sci-fi book. And uh, thank you. Um, anyway, I was wondering if you were involved in any sort of like a sci-fi writer community online to where you can get regular feedback on your work. 
Uh, I am not, I, I used to be, when I was publishing things to my website, I would get feedback from my readers and stuff like that. Can't really do that now because of the nature of my contracts, the publishing contracts. I can't let people see what I'm writing. Yeah. So I have like my core group of friends that I trust and I get feedback from them, but I, I, can't, I can't do that to you know, people online or my stuff would be posted all over the place instantly. Right. Okay, we got about uh, two more minutes, so let's go as quickly as possible, go. Okay, this is about the egg. If the people, like the egg people that hatched from the egg were also living in an egg, by the third permutation of this whole egg thing, do you think they'd be really weirded out by it and stop having kids? Or do you think it would go on forever? People don't they, like, know get that they're... Within the context of the egg, <laughs> it's a short story I wrote, where it turns out everybody gets reincarnated. When you die, you get reincarnated to somewhere, some human being somewhere in time, and you find out that every human being on Earth is just the, the single one soul moving through time. And once you've experienced every human lifetime, you will be born into God's world, and then you will be an infant there. And that's what's necessary to develop enough to be born into God's world, and God is really your parent. There, I've spoiled the egg. <laughs> now, um, they don't know between each life what's but going on. But they're also in the egg in God's world in this question. Well, the, the, in, it's, it's an they're egg. They're in another egg. <laughs> oh, you mean know. the gods are in yeah, an yeah, egg? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so it's egg. like eggs. It's turtles eggs all the way ever. down. Eggs, like, all yeah, okay. eggs all the way up. <laughs> I didn't think about it that way through, that far through. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. Okay. Next question. Go. Yeah. Do you have any big thoughts or plans for writing a larger like series rather than singular novels in the future? Yeah, I wanted Artemis to be the beginning of a series. I loved Artemis. Thanks. I don't think it was a sophomore slump at all. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted Artemis, I was talking about Terry Pratchett earlier, I wanted Artemis Genius. to be my Ankh Mor Pork, right? I wanted that to be a setting where all sorts of cool stuff happens. It doesn't need to be, you know, it, uh, the next book I was going to have Rudy, the cop, be the main character, yeah. stuff like that. But it wasn't as popular and the publisher's like, nah, write something else. Okay, right. thank you. We're going to go. Go. How is the electro, or rather the astrophage, not the electron pump from Asimov's The Gods Themselves? I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's a, there we go, that's the answer. It's a plot <laughs> device where Asimov says, we'll have an unlimited power source if we can only get a few subatomic particles from a universe that has like a slightly different, strong, you know, uh, nuclear force. Sounds really cool. It might be the case that Asimov's a better writer than me. No, no <laughs> way. Question over here, and then we're going to finish up with over here. I'm sorry, everybody else was in line. Go, okay, go. Speaking of huge piles of money, do yes. you get approached for product placement in your books? And whether or not you do, how would you consider that? A uh, hot no, cup of Campbell's soup. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I don't, and I don't think I would. I mean, well, I mean, my hat's for sale. If people offered me enough money, I'd do it. But... Um, I don't know. There's only three guys. There's only three people. Left. All right, let's, fine. Let's, let's okay, do them all. as quickly as we can. All right, you sleep. I watch. I know you're not going to answer, but does Gray stay on air, or does he go home? Does Gray stay? I no answer for you there. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay, go. How did writing The Martian impact writing um, Hail Mary? Like, was the process different at all? Yeah, the process was very different because I wasn't uh, giving it out chapter by chapter and getting feedback. I had to write the whole thing at once. Um, so yeah, it was a very different process. But uh, it went well, because I'm a great editor. And, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Last question. Go. Yes. Uh, what's your definition for success? Are you a successful person? Yeah. Are you successful? I think so. <laughs> um, I, but, but that's a good question. You know, I mean, there's the old adage, money doesn't buy happiness. But it can really kind of rent it, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, so basically, I, 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 I have enough money that that's not a constant um, stress for me. I, I've yep. got, a, got a wonderful wife, I've got a baby, I'm, I'm happy, um, I've got roomfuls of people that'll come to see me. I mean, I kind of like everything that's going on right now. Yeah. So I, I would say it's successful in as much as um, the events in my life have caused me to be happy. Yeah. And they never really did before, so thanks. There we go. Thank you. This has been a Metro TV production.